Before we start, I just want to I just want to get some feedback. Um, just I want to see if you've done like if you've done the to do app in React. Could you like put your hand up? And then if you've actually keep your hands up, please. If you've actually like done like a personal project or an experiment outside of the to do app, uh, could you keep your hand up? Otherwise, put your hand down. Okay. How many of you are actually using React in production on projects? Okay, quite, quite good, actually. Very cool. Um, okay, just out of curiosity, put your hand up if you've used either CSS transition, CSS animation, tween libraries like GSAP or tweener, uh, just anything to do with animation. Okay, cool. It seems like everybody's done something. Okay, so um, this is going to be React for Vikings. Um, so again, my name is Miko Hapoya. I'm director of creative technology at Jam3. Uh, that's a pretty crazy title. Uh, I've been at Jam3 for about eight years now, so I hold a lot of hats. Um, primarily, I direct the way that our technology goes. So I'm figuring out new technologies as they're coming up and kind of figuring out what suits us, for, uh, what suits our business uh, um, objectives, you know, what works from like, uh, what we're, uh, like what libraries work for what we're well known for and, you know, just in general kind of like directing technology. I also help uh, train students as they come um, to work at Jam3. We have like a pretty successful co-op program where we hire a lot of junior developers out of. Um, and I do a lot of research in writing modules and libraries. So uh, check those out on NPM. Um, but basically, I've been wrangling in animations for 10 years or so now. And I'm a dad of two kids and husband to one wife. I don't know why I had to mention that. But anyways. Um, so Jam3, my uh, employer, it's a digital agency in Toronto. Uh, we do highly experiential uh, work. So basically, we don't necessarily, I mean, we do make websites that the main objective is to render data and all that stuff. But most of our sites are animation heavy, might involve WebGL, and might be very experimental. So like two weeks ago, I was working on some web VR projects. Uh, this week, I've been working on some internal uh, Google research projects. But in general, it's very fun programming, a very artsy fun programming. Um, and we do a lot of open source code at Jam3. So this is something that's kind of new. Uh, with uh, NPM becoming very popular, uh, we've just started going crazy and just putting modules out there. So I think in the past year and a half, Jam3's org has gone from like two public repos to over 100 now. So go and check those out. Basically, there's everything that you'd need to do front end dev. And we're always hiring. So if you want to work with us, just send your resume. Um, I can get you the email after. I'm not going to say it now. <laughs> but yeah. OK, so Vikings. Um, I'm going to show you the Viking site that I just worked on. Um, let me just refresh. Oops. We're deep linking in, so I'm just going to make sure we're going right off the bat. Um, the only thing that's loaded off the internet is the fonts, but it looks like they're loading too, so we're good. Um, I don't know why there's no audio, but there should be audio playing right now, but it doesn't matter that much. So this was a, this site is actually all built in React. Um, this page is also built in React, but it's actually um, running WebGL kind of wrapped with React. And that's really nice because you can have a really senior developer develop the WebGL components and then, you know, a much uh, intermediate or junior developer implement those in the site. So. This was kind of a cool thing. Um, I actually had the pleasure of working with Hugh Kennedy, who's a, a serious open source con contributor. I think he has like 300 modules on NPM. So he built this page, which was pretty cool. Um, let's go here. So this site is basically like a behind the scenes site uh, for Vikings. Um, they went, uh, some people from Jam3 went to Ireland to shoot this video. They brought the actors on set and just kind of walked through different areas of the set. Uh, it's actually kind of fun. If you're a big Vikings well, fan, I suggest checking out this site. Built his so again, all, everything is built in React in this site. There's no WebGL on this page currently. Uh, just video and everything is rendered on the DOM. So there's some nice UI components um, that we built. Pay attention to this top corner logo here. It's funny because it's like um, 
you don't even see it there, but it's actually one of the, one of the most advanced UI components on the entire site, <laughs> which is kind of like a funny thing that happens. Designers just like, ah, let's just put the logo up there, and it ends up being the craziest thing ever. But um, these, this is a content page, so um, it's kind of rendering a little bit funny on this resolution, um, but whatever. Um, Basically, there's three different kinds of content pages. There's video pages, uh, 360 panorama pages, which are rendering in WebGL. So we have like a component that you can just drop in and do like Google Street View style images. And then also just like a regular content image page. Um, it's a, actually a pretty small site. There's a lot going on in terms of animation. Um, but this was a pretty intense page, which is just basically shows all the content in the site on one page. Um, yeah, so if I click on here, I'll just go to a 360 content page. Oh, small bug there. But. Yeah, so that's uh, the Viking site. So uh, at Jam3, I do a, mostly my development is now uh, research related, but I actually said I wanted to jump on a project and they put me on the Viking site. And the reasons why I wanted to jump on the Viking site was first just to try out new, th new ways of working. Because our, our tool chain is changing so much, like every week it feels like there's something new coming and I'm sure that you guys have felt that. I just wanted to evaluate all the tools that we were using. Like I hadn't actually used Babel in, uh, in production too, so this was the first site I used that on. I wanted to evaluate React. Uh, I felt that React wasn't a library that we could necessarily use because we couldn't do highly orchestrated animations. And obviously you can see Vikings is, has some pretty intense animations, so that's not true anymore for me. Um, and then I wanted to evaluate F1. F1 is um, a library that I've written, and I'll just talk about that mostly in this talk. So why did we start looking at React at Jam3? Because you wouldn't think that we would necessarily use something like React. And I think the number one reason why we started looking at React was because of the community around React. Uh, community is huge if you don't realize that. Like we were, up until this point, we were basically using our own homegrown libraries or kind of like libraries that weren't so popular. Um, but I. I kind of made the decision that we should look at React so that we can kind of grow into this bigger community. As a company, that's a big thing because your hiring pool becomes much larger. Um, you know, there are more tools, more libraries, stuff like that, just more of everything. So that's why we started doing that, looking at React from a community standpoint. One thing I really like about React is it has a really small, consistent API. So I'm sure that all of you guys know the lifecycle hooks. That's really all you need to know in React, and then maybe how to like wrangle JSX, and you're good to go. Uh, and that's a really powerful thing, because Jam3 is a company that's growing huge. And when you're hiring um, lots of new developers, you want to get them up and running on projects as fast as possible. And then components, components, components. I'm sure all of you guys know that uh, you can write a project and basically have half of the code base be reusable on another project. So it's pretty cool. Like I can take those components from the Viking site and now start using them on another site. Because it's Jam3, I probably have to like skin them like crazy, but it's there. So uh, on a high level, what did I use to build Vikings? We used uh, Redux. We used React Router, which you guys have heard about. React Transition Group is something that you haven't heard about today yet. React Transition Group basically is a component um, that you can um, wrap your other components with, and then you have to implement life, uh, these special life cycle hooks. And basically, those life cycle hooks get called when your component is, uh, is mounted. And um, that, those new life cycle hooks return back a function that you're supposed to call when animations have finished. So basically, th this is what you would maybe use for a page. So the page would uh, implement this, uh, implement um, or use React transition groups, uh, life cycle hooks, and basically just notify the application, hey, I've animated it now, uh, and I've animated out now. Um, so basically then you can have pages transition and transition out. And then React F1 is the final bit that we used, and I'll talk about React F1. So I mentioned earlier, F1 is a library that I've written. 
Uh, it's a UI animation library. You probably heard that term lots of times. Uh, and, you know, like tweening engines, I don't think they're actually UI animation libraries. I think they're just animation libraries. Like, you can't just write one tween and have your entire UI built with it. But uh, React F1 and F1 allows you to do that, so you can just use one component and have a full piece of UI that's fully animated. Uh, it's inspired by the way that designers work. Um, it's, it ha it, you can build highly orchestrated animations with it. It's cross-platform, so it works in React, but you can also use it in the basic DOM. You can use it with Canvas, you can use it with WebGL, you can use it with whatever, which is really important for JM3 because we're working on so many, you can use it with SVG too, you can use it with anything. So that's a really important thing because like, our technology is changing all the time. Um, so just in, in detail, React F1 actually uses F1 DOM, because F1 DOM targets the basic DOM, and then F1 DOM uses F1, and F1 is like really low level and it can work on anything. Um, it uses pathfinding, and you'll see what that means. Uh, just remember that it gives you a better separation of concerns. So basically, your application logic is completely separate from your animation logic. So pathfinding, if you don't know what it is, um, the best way to describe it, if you think about a UI, uh, a piece of UI, and compare it to a city, um, if, we, if we think about, um, let's say that you're in Pickering, and you have to drive to Mississauga, you know that you're going to have to drive through Toronto, right? It's the same thing. It should be the same thing with UI. If you're, like, animated out and you need to go to the rolled-over state, well, you know that you should animate through the idle state to get to the rollover state. But I'm sure that many of you guys have had to write code where it's like, if I'm not... If I haven't gone to the rollover state yet, then do this. And it just becomes, like, a mess, right? Um... And so F1 kind of fixes that. So um, I'm just going to show a quick demo. Um, so this is a piece of React F1, uh, or it's a UI component built with React F1. Um, it has three states. It has the out, out state, idle state, which is what we see now, and then an over state. So this is the over state. To be able to see the out state, I'm just going to refresh the page because it immediately animates in. So it just like kind of fades in. Um, these... These lines right here actually describe how you can traverse or go through this, this app. So if I click here and I go to the overstate, when I, or when I roll over and I go to the overstate, now when I click, it'll actually go into the outstate, right? Might be kind of hard to see, but there's little arrows at the ends of the lines. Basically, those arrows mean that I can go from the out... So when there's an uh, arrow down here, it means I can go from the out state to the idle. And because there's an arrow up here, it means I can go from the idle to out. So you might notice that all these uh, transitions are bidirectional, except for this guy right here, which is, uh, is just goes in a single direction. Uh, and so I'm just going to show you one kind of neat thing about F1. Uh, it always attempts to get to its state based on the shortest route possible. So you saw when I was over here and I clicked, it'll just go that through there. But if you look at it, I could technically go back and then out if I press while it's uh, going into its rollover state. So I'm gonna like test my APM skills here. I'm gonna try to click when it's right about here. If I click anywhere out here, it would actually take that route. So, well, yeah, I'm gonna have to really concentrate on this. See there? Now it just went back, right? So that's a really powerful concept because you want to be able to animate. You don't want to force the user to watch like animations that don't need to be there. Okay? So um, remember I was talking about separation of concerns? So typically what th this is how you would work. Uh, you know, you would have some sort of event, in our case, we're like, click. Um, but if our component had a rollover state, we'd have to say, like, if we haven't rolled over, animate to the rollover, then animate to the press. And this, like, seems really silly, but our designers ask for this kind of stuff all the time. Else, we finish the rollover animation and just simply animate to the press. And that's like a lot of logic that you end up writing over and over and over again, and it's like really silly, like you shouldn't have to. 
um, do that ever. So in F1, it actually lo ends up looking like this. It just says div on click, F1, I don't care, just animate to press, right? So that's how that works. So I said that uh, F1 is dis inspired by the way designers work. Um, designers will always design the look of a button in each state. They'll be like, okay, this is what it looks like in the idle. Uh, if your designer's good, they'll actually design a rollover state for you and potentially any other states like press down. I know that some designers just like, I forgot, and they never do it, and then you end up guessing like what that UI looks like. But if your designers are good, they'll design every state for you. Then after that, they'll, if they're good, they'll actually give descriptions of how that thing is going to animate instead of like just like letting you do your crazy animations. And then they're like, I don't actually like that, and you end up having to redo it the way they want it anyways. But anyways, enough about that. Um, anyways, the, one of the coolest things is that when a library is inspired by the way that designers work, it means that you can build tooling so that designers can actually start building UI for you. And that's the roadmap for F1, basically. Right now, we're starting to use it in development. But in the end, we want to use something like uh, After Effects or Flash Animate, whatever it's called, to actually get the designers to start creating like full UI pieces for us without ever having to involve the de developer at all. So uh, when you're in code, this is what a state looks like, or how you define your states. It's just going to be a basic JSON-like object, and you're going to de define each one of your states. So if we were building a button, we'd have an out state, which is, means that it hasn't animated in yet. We have an idle state, what it's going to look like when it's just sitting there and not being interacted with it. Over is when you've used your mouse and rolled over. Then you're going to add in uh, the elements of your UI. So let's say that we have a background and an icon in front. You're just going to repeat that lots of times. After that, we're going to basically say, like, OK, in the out state, the background should look like this, and the icon should look like this. This is just CSS with uh, a couple little properties added, and I'll talk about this after. Um, but again, you're going to do this for each one of your states which means that your code, if you've ever used a tweening engine, your code becomes like a massive spaghetti ball. You're going to have animation logic here, animation logic there. And then that was always a disaster for us because we'd have to, like, the designers would want to change animations, and you'd have to walk through code and try to figure out where you change that animation. It was a disaster. But the nice thing is, uh, you know, your states are all defined in one spot, what the button look would look like in every state in one file. So scale, one of the most popular uh, uh, CSS uh, properties that you'll use, most likely use to, to animate things nowadays is transforms. But transforms in themselves are pretty crappy to animate. Um, so what F1 actually d does is it breaks down scales, transforms, and rotations into their individual animate. Uh, individual components, and then later on, what actually gets created is like a transformation array gets created, and then it gets applied through the one transform property. It's a little bit complex, but it's pretty simple. Uh, pretty simple in the end. Um, this it might look kind of scary because you're like scale zero one. This is actually the x scale will be zero, and the y scale will be one in the in the out state for the background. And uh, if you add it in a third parameter, then that would be Z. In the case of background color, this is just going to be R, G, B. So this is going to be black. And if you wanted alpha, all you have to do is just add a fourth uh, number to it. Um, this is actually heavily inspired by StackGL, which is a pretty cool project. You should check it out. Um, in React land, this is what it looks like. There's obviously going to be all that boilerplate that you have to write to like actually create a component. But in your render function, it would look like this. Note that we're, um, we're just requiring in our states file. I'm sorry if you're like an import fan. I'm not. <laughs> I like requires. But uh, yeah, we're going to define our state, which was over here in a separate file. And I'll talk about that later. In React, you're going to just uh, you're going to use the React F1 component, uh, and you're going to pass in the states to the states uh, property. And the only kind of funky thing is that these uh, the thing 
this div here would actually define the background, which is over here. And you kind of hook it up to the states with these data F1 tags. That's probably the most complex part of when you're using it in React. So transitions. Transitions are the animations. So um, notice that in that previous one, we were just defining states. Now we need to add logic to be able to say, like, you can go from this state to this one. And that's all that this guy does. We, can say, we say that, hey, we can go from the out state to the idle, and we can go from the idle to the over. But you see, like, there's, like, repetition here. I'm, like, out to idle, out to idle to out. Because technically, you could have a... Oh, rollovers are a good example of that. Your rollover might be like a 0.5 second animation, but your rollout might be a 0.25 second because you don't want to force the user to have to watch a longer animation when they don't really actually care about that button because they've rolled off of it. So that's why you have kind of like uh, all your transitions and animation that are uh, working in a single direction. However, because programmers are lazy, I added in by true. So you can just do that if you really want. And what actually happens is when you define your transitions this way, your animations will by default have a duration of 0.5. So when, as a developer, when you're working on, on, on a React F1 component, you can just define your states, define your transitions really quickly, and like not worry about what the animations are going to look like, and just have something on screen already appearing. But later on, you're going to want to define nicer animations. So this is how you would define the animation. So again, we're just sitting in this uh, transitions object uh, file, and you're going to say from out to idle, and then by true. And then animation is actually what defines what the animation is going to look like. So this component would animate now in 0.25 seconds, and it would be delay. Everything would be delayed by one second. And this is the ease equation that it's going to use. If you haven't used eases, I highly recommend it. If you start using eases, your UI will automatically look a lot nicer. Um, but this eases um, module is really cool. You should check it out. My buddy Matt D wrote it. Um, so we're going to get a little bit fancier with uh, F1 animations. And so this is the exact same thing. I just removed all that other code defining what state you can go to. And just specifically, we want to look at the animations file. So um, in this case, we still have the duration is 0.25, delay is 0. And what we can actually say is that the the icon itself actually will animate in 0.1 and have a delay of 0.15. So that's really cool because now you could have everything animate in 0.25 and then just that one guy animate in 0.1. But then we can even get fancier, and this is, I don't think I've seen this in any other library, where we can actually drill down to the specific uh, style and we can say, well, actually, just the top should animate in 0.25 and have this ease. So you can go all the way down to the chain and animate individual components and properties and whatever in like um, without, um, yeah, anyways, you can go crazy with your animations and you should be able to do everything that your designers ask you to do. So this is what it looks like in React land. Uh, just require and transitions, pass it to the transitions uh, property. Nothing changes here, it stays the same. So something I haven't really explained is like, how do you actually go places? Uh, well, it's just done through this property where you say go to the state. So you could say go to out, go to idle. So that again, your um, imagine in your um, event event handlers, you could just set a state variable for what state you want to go to, the idle state, the over state, whatever you want. And then on complete gets fired once you're in that state. On update fires every time the animation is updating, so you could do fancy things based on that. And then states and transitions is what you've seen. So remember I said, I think states and transitions should be defined in their own files. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So I'm going to actually show you the source code for Vikings, well, at least a part of it. Um, so remember I said components, components, components? Well, this is how many component UI components we created on Vikings. And the cool thing is that 
all of these are completely presentational and we should be able to take them out and use them on another project. And the fun thing is our designers are starting to do that. They're like, hey, that's scrub bar. We're going to take it to another project. So that saves me time and it allows me to focus on the cool stuff, the fun stuff, like WebGL and all these other things. I don't have to worry about UI. Um, but anyways, um, these are the components. Uh, we're going to look at the button burger component. And um, I'll show you something cool. So I actually had designers programming for me on this project. And this is how they programmed. Um, basically, they, uh, they would, I set up a bunch of tools for them. And you don't actually realize how many tools developers use until you have to install it for a designer <laughs> on their crazy system. So there's actually a cool, uh, cool uh, project that we're working on in, in our GitHub org where there's just like a single executable, executable you run that installs GitHub desktop because designers don't want to use terminal for Git. We had them using Git because we wanted to get LFS or assets and everything else. Uh, it installs Sublime, it installs NPM in Node, it installs, uh, I think it installs Grunt just because it's like an old dependency. We don't use, we use NPM scripts, scripts more nowadays. So I'm going to show you one NPM script I wrote for this project. And it's, I kind of mount, uh, it's set up on NPM test. So when I say NPM test, it basically mo uh, moves all the assets out of raw assets to assets. Uh, we do that because we want to optimize our assets before we uh, deploy to production. Ignore that error. It's just because I didn't have time on project to fix it. But anyways, it gives us this massive list now of every single component in this project, or almost. And uh, I can actually go over here, and we said we're going to look at button burger. I can actually say four, and press the number four. You didn't see that. And then I hit enter. And what it'll actually do is it'll run this cool module called Budo on one uh, JavaScript file, and now I can run that one component by itself. So for a, as a dev, that's really cool, because now on project, you don't have to navigate to that page to test that dumb component. You can just run it really quickly and then go crazy uh, and fix things. And the cool thing is, um, this is the source code for the button burger. Um, Index.js, I don't think I can make this bigger, so I'm sorry. But there's an index.js file which contains all the logic that sits inside React. Um, then there's the states object, which we've kind of covered. Uh, as you can see, they can get kind of big, but it's actually not that big when you start looking at it, the individual um, UI components and the transitions files. So the cool thing was I had designers code for me because they knew that each one of our Oh, that's a bad example. <laughs> but uh, almost all of these components all have index.js states transitions. So a designer doesn't have to go hunting through your code. They just know if I want to tweak animation timings, all I have to do is go to the transitions object. So for instance, let's say that I wanted to uh, make this background take a lot longer to animate in. I could just go in and be like, 10 seconds, and now it's animating for 10 seconds, right? Um, and the cool thing was you saw uh, it automatically reloads because um, Budo, the tool that I'm using, B-U-D-O, I'll have a link at the end, uh, it's actually faster than Watchify out of the box uh, because of some of the work that Matt did. But anyways, uh, for, it's really nice for a designer when they can just change the file, hit save, and it auto-reloads and runs it. Uh, to me, when you're working in this kind of method, hot reloading is kind of a non-issue because if you can run the component by itself, why would you ever need to set up hot reloading, which is a potential thing that will break all the time anyways, and it requires a lot of setup. So this is, I think, kind of a nice uh, keep it simple stupid method of doing that. Um, so the kind of funny thing happened was I thought that literally designers would go in and start modifying just animation timings and delays and eases. And they did that initially. But then they started adding new states. And then they started modifying CSS. And I felt sick at one point in the project because I was thinking like, oh, shoot, when QA rolls around, I'm going to have at least four days of work to like fix all this stuff. But it never happened. And that's really, really powerful to me. Um, yeah, I could talk about all this whole tool chain for a while, but 
NPM scripts are really powerful. Okay. So it seems really funny just to have two variables go and on complete. Those are re it's really simple, but it's actually really, really powerful because now your entire application is really consistent. To go all the way down from a page down to the smallest UI comp component, you're always just going to be using go and uncomplete. So as a developer, it becomes really easy to debug. All you have to do is just put a console log in your render, in your render function and see what, what state it should be going into. And then if it doesn't go, you can start investigating why it didn't go there. And it also creates very, very testable code. If I can tell my UI component, hey, you should go into that state, and it doesn't, uh, the test will fail. And once it goes to on complete to that state, I can actually grab the CSS that React would have rendered and check if it rendered correctly. So that means that I can write really nice unit tests on my code, even though it's UI and it's anim animated, which are some of the hardest things to write unit tests for. So something's missing, and that's chief. Uh, this is basically like a manager or controller class, but I hate those terms, so I just call it chief because it sounds a lot cooler too. Um, something that you might have not realized is that this library is called F1 because I'm a pretty big Formula One fan, and underneath the hood, there's a little module called Kimi that does the pathfinding, and if you know F1, there's a ra uh, race car driver named Kimi Raikkonen who's actually Finnish, like me, and so that's why it's named F1. And so this is like race chief. And the race chief basically is able to control all UI components. So React F, uh, chief is React F1's boss. Chief components tell other UI components what state they should be in, right? So as chief states look like this. I designed, them to, I designed it to look very similar to React F1's uh, states because it would be really annoying if the API was completely different. But um, you're going to basically define your states out and idle. So like, let's say that you have a page and you want uh, certain components to animate in. Well, you would say that in the out state, button one, you should be in out. Button two, you should be in out. Footer, you should go and be in out two because you're totally different than buttons. And then in the idle state, buttons should go to idle, and footer is, again, is the odd duck out and actually goes to idle, idle fancy. But the cool thing is that you can actually do things like this. When you define your transitions file, you, again, you say, we can go from out to idle, and uh, our animation is actually going to be this. The, fir the button one should animate in immediately because it has a delay of zero, but then button two should animate in half a second later, and then the footer should animate in one second later. So if you ever have an application and everything animates out at once, there's two things that happen. You're going to have really bad performance because the DOM is actually pretty crappy on performance, and uh, that's why we use WebGL a lot because we don't like dealing with performance issues. Um, and uh, it will look really ugly because everything's animating out. Like pro tip, if you want to make your page look cool, just start at the top and then just animate in everything uh, one at a time going down. And that's like the simplest way to make something look really nice. Okay, so this is what chief looks like when you're using it. Um, uh, when you require or import chief in, you just basically say chief require react f1 slash chief. Uh, and then you're going to do all that React stuff to create components, and your render function will look like this. Chief, uh, sorry I put this in one line, I just wanted to make sure it fits on one slide. Go to the out state, and on complete, handle on complete. So this is, this is where React transition com group comes in, because now I could call that callback method from React transition group and say like, hey, we're in the out idle state, which means that we've animated in, or you know, we can call the callback for animated out uh, in this function. And then your states and transitions are just passed in like that. So this part looks a little bit different. Um, what actually happens is that you might notice that this is the uh, only child that Chief takes in, and it's a function. This is the actual only nice way in React to be able to define properties on children. Um, and you'll see if there's another cool uh, library out there called React Motion. React Motion actually inspired this. 
So basically, this object will contain what state each button should be in, and also the oncomplete uh, callback that they should call when they get to their states. So it kind of looks like this when it's exploded. So button, go to out, oncomplete, fire this callback from chief. Because chief needs to know once all those components have animated in that it's in its own state. Um, so there's a little bit of, I think all animations in React should be done this way, where you're passing in uh, a calculated state and then it would be applied. And this state could hold, for instance, the styles that this button should be in. But there's one little problem with that, and I didn't realize it until I was working on, on, the, on uh, the gallery page for uh, Vikings. Uh, React, it's advertised as a really fast library, but it's fast for some things, very bad for others. And styles actually get diffed. So that's pretty crazy, um, because style, when you're animating something, styles are changing all the time, right? And imagine diffing happening at 60 frames per second. That's just not going to perform. So I literally was like, because up until this point, I had been programming those components as individual pieces. Then it came time to put it into the gallery, where I was now rendering that one tile component multiple times. And performance was absolutely horrible. I was actually running at like 10 frames per second when I was scrolling. And so that, this kind of shows that. Um, so basically, in 2.32 seconds, 1.73 seconds was spent on scripting. So you can kind of see it's a huge chunk of, of that 2.32 seconds. Then the green and the uh, blue, purple and the green are basically for, they're combined for rendering. And then, I don't know what other is, but I guess Chrome does other things too. But uh, this is after I circumvented React's prop styles and just literally started uh, modifying HTML element styles Basically, went, we, uh, we went from 1.73 seconds spell, spent on scripting to five, uh, 598 milliseconds. So that's a huge performance increase. Uh, and so if you're doing animations, that's why I don't really, I think React Motion's a really cool library, but I don't know if it will actually perform in, in production. Uh, I wish you could do animations through props fully, but I don't think it's possible right now maybe when React version 15 comes out, but I don't think so because that's not on the roadmap. But anyways, uh, yeah. So don't, don't animate using prop styles if you're doing lots of stuff. It might be fine for just little things here and there. So there's a couple other features of F1. Uh, again, you can write custom parsers. So uh, you saw that I had that scale variable. You could, for instance, write your own variable that does something else, like you could go nuts. Uh, you can actually pass in transitions as functions. Um, so basically, when I say animate and I pass an object, you can actually pass in a function. And you can you, basically, that means, hey, don't worry about the animation. Just pass me zeros and ones, and I'll interpolate those animations. And that allows you to do some really, really cool things. F1 is headed right now in a direction where we're going to get better documentation. We've started working on a, like a, one of those like classic, this is our JavaScript library and we're selling it hard type sites. So we're going to have something like that soon and then better documentation. Uh, there is some documentation out there. It's just kind of spread out all over the place. So that site will just kind of gather it all together. Uh, we're going to have tooling. So we want to create a unit testing harness so that you'll base, basically be able to just say, hey, that component, test it. Uh, and we want to integrate into After Effects and animate. Uh, that's what I'm going to start. I actually started this week, and I hope to have it done in six months. We'll see how much other work I have to do at Jam3. But uh, yeah, and then we want to be able to create like nice galleries, so you could basically um, be able to take all your components and just view them in one spot. So then designers could be like, okay, I want to use that component for this project, et cetera. There's going to be so much tooling that we're going to do around this thing. Here's some links. No need to take a picture because I'm going to share these, but I guess I want to just talk a little bit about what they are. So React F1 is obviously what we've talked about mostly. Eases is um, as a grab bag of pen or easing equations, if you know what that is. Eases fancy is something I wrote this week, which is actually like more easing functions on top of this. Easing is a really cool thing. You should look into it. 
Uh, F1 tutorial is actually a tutorial on how to use F1. It's a little bit out of date because I modified some of the API, but uh, there's a pull request to get it up to date. I just gotta review it. Um, F1 DOM is if you wanna do F1 animations just on the DOM. And that's the cool part, is if React ever becomes not popular, we can still use the exact states and transitions in the future, as long as we're working with the DOM. Uh, F1 is the kind of like the engine of the whole thing. Well, not really, because Kimi is. <laughs> but Budo is that library that I was using that basically allows you to take any JavaScript file and say run, and it will open a browser window and start, it'll actually create an index HTML file for you, so you don't have to write HTML, just run it. Um, it's really cool. Matt Dezel wrote it, he works at JM3. Uh, React Router, we've talked about that. React Add-ons Transition Group is what Transition Group is. Uh, there's that little demo with the button that you could roll over and the graph moves around. It actually sits here. Uh, I haven't put it on NPM, but um, there's all my NPM modules in Twitter. You can hit me up on Twitter for questions. I'm on there often. Um, thank you. Do we have time for questions? Is there any questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned using WebGL for sort of like better performance. Yeah. Have you decided when you switch over? Yeah. So uh, text is really hard to render in WebGL. So that's like a rule of thumb. If you need to render text, we generally will use the DOM because it'll be easier. Now we've written some modules to use like signs dis sign distance fields to render text. And it's kind of cool because we put that uh, uh, repo out there and then all of a sudden like these really niche developers from all over the world started contributing. Like there's like a guy from Google and that's his only job is to render text in, on the GPU. And he started contributing to that. Uh, but that's like a rule of thumb. Uh, obviously if it's anything 3D, we use WebGL. So it's kind of like, kind of binary. If it's like, if it's text, we'll probably use the DOM. Although there's a site we did for Mustang and it actually renders everything in WebGL. Uh, and I think, I think that's where we want to head, where we're rendering everything in WebGL, um, because that allows us a lot more control. Uh, I don't really like the DOM, personally. So, um, and CSS. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think they can be made much more performant, but anyways, we can talk about that after if you want. Uh, yeah? Um, is there animation stuff in terms of the performance of the stuff? Like, are you using, are you actually using animation using JavaScript? Yeah, yeah, so, it, so this is kind of funny. I knew that this would come up. Um, so there's been a, I think it's a misconception when people say that, um, animation through CSS is more performant than JavaScript because it renders on the GPU. If you actually start working with GPUs, that doesn't actually make sense up until you start having like thousands and thousands and thousands of UI components. It actually would be more, uh, it would be less performant to use the GPU if you have, let's say, five uh, components. So I think in the end, uh, the browser vendors, I think they've implemented uh, rend uh, l linear interpolation using uh, the CPU, to be honest. So yeah, animations are happening all in JavaScript. And there's a couple articles that have been written about the performance of CSS and JavaScript, and there really isn't any performance difference. So I can, I can link you up to the article if you wanna see it. But uh, yeah, it's a com complete common misconception. Actually, the performance, the reason why people often said that it was faster to animate through CSS is because all the demos were using trans, uh, transition, uh, sorry, transform, which get pushed onto the GPU. So it was the properties that were being animated often rather than the actual animation that was causing them to be faster. Yeah, so that actually that graph uh, with the dot going around, that's actually SVG. Um, that was my first foray in React SVG and React F1. So um, still new. It's something that's on our roadmap to actually like support like full, like every single property in SVG. Um, but it would be built into F1 DOM, which means that once F1 DOM gets updated, React F1 automatically gets those features. Uh, is there any other questions? Yeah, I mean, so like, um, 
there's a quite a, uh, you obviously saw there's quite a bit of code that you have to write. Um, I'm kind of like trying to figure out a way to like, if you just have two states, to be able to write that much easier. Um, but for most cases, I would use it. If you have a U piece of UI, which is like every site, I would suggest using React F1 <laughs> because it just like, it cleans up your code base a lot when you don't have to like, when all the animation logic just li lives in React F1, you don't have to worry about so much and it'll clean up so much. And again, maybe you'll be able to get your designers to start programming too. And it, by the way, I didn't mention that he's not like a senior designer, he's just like an intermediate. So that, that might be an important factor for you because some people might think like, Oh, like it was like a really senior guy, but yeah. Uh, I'd like to know how you deal with the strategy of like response, uh, response to websites. How yeah. Do you all this content, like the web yell, yeah. Responsibly? Well, the first rule of thumb is just kiss. Keep it simple. Like, if you can have less container elements and all these things, you're gonna have a m more performant application. And actually, when I'm like having performance issues, I'll cut out things and see if it performs, uh, increases performance. Um, through, like you're always gonna have a more performant application if you're rendering in WebGL versus the DOM, but the reality is that you're not gonna be, it's not gonna make sense, sense from like a business and production perspective to do everything in WebGL right now, hopefully in the future, but not right now. Um, but. Um, use CSS transforms, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, our GPUs are so powerful now that that's really the most performant way to animate. Um, any other questions? Just, yeah. Like in terms of like most content, like most JavaScript, oh. files, how would you like, what is our strategy? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the night, the, I guess that's a luxury that we have at Jam3 often is because our sites are like so experiential, we can have a loader up front to load that because then people are actually engaged. Like we have time, uh, people sit on our sites for like 20 minutes just playing around. Uh, so we'll actually have like, like our kind of like best practice is to create like a really simple preloader that doesn't have, like this file size is like 10K and then you load in like the JavaScript and any assets that are absolutely required to run the application, and then preload everything else as you're going through the application in the smart ways. Preloading is actually pretty complicated, uh, you, and we started doing something called paper testing where we actually print out the site, and then during that time we actually say, okay, this is where we should have a loader. Uh, but yeah, preloading is complicated. Well, that's all 